Uh, it's good to be with you this morning, and uh, we're going to continue on. I really appreciate the uh, uh, Eastern European missions uh, that we had last week, and uh, it fits right in with what we are studying concerning the conversions uh, in the book of Acts. Um, and like I say, we, we talked somewhat about, uh, you know, the thing is that, that we send missionaries all over the world to preach and teach and so forth. But with the world situation the way it is, and, and so many places have become more and more dangerous, there are many people that are coming here. And in fact, we have an example of it this morning. I'm going to let Bob introduce. We've got a couple here, and uh, they're from, from Europe. And... Uh, Uh, does the baby cry in Romanian? <laughs> okay, I hope, at any rate, uh, anyway, we're glad to have you with us, uh, and uh, at any rate, they also speak Spanish. Um, like I told them, I, uh, yo hablo poquito espanol, and muy poquito espanol, so uh, at any rate, uh, we, we try to communicate just a little bit there, but we're, we're glad, glad you're here. Um, at any rate, the conversions of the book of Acts, they're, they are all different. And the reason that we are studying this, you know, once again, is because we're going to encounter various peoples, various situations. One way does not work for everybody in every, in every situation. And I think that's one of the reasons we have so many conversions in the book of Acts is because it gives us different examples how to talk to different people. And we've already looked a little bit at some of these, but I want to kind of go back and, and start back at uh, the day of Pentecost, but also gave you six questions to ask in which that, that uh, deciding on, on where we need to start when we try to share someone, share with someone the word of God or the gospel. Um, and number one is who is responding? What's their background? Uh, like, say, there are various backgrounds in the book of Acts. Uh, some from the background of, of course, Judaism. That's, that's where they started. But then we have, of course, when we get to uh, Athens, what's the background of those people? Quite different. Judaism is not a part of, of their thought and so forth. In fact, they uh, worshipped idols. And how would you deal with that? Well... We have an example set to, to show us how to deal with that and how Paul did. Uh, number two, would you consider them a good prospect? Uh, like I say, they're one good brother who has written books on evangelism, and he says that we need to, you know, try and size someone up. Okay, would they be a good prospect? Should, are they someone I should try to share the gospel with? Well, that kind of overrides the Great Commission, which says to go where? All the world. And again, we have example after example in the book of Acts of all kinds of people that were thought probably not to be good prospects. And we'll look at some of those. Number three, where are they at in their relationship to God or Jesus? In the book of Acts, did everybody know about God? Again, Athens, how much did they know? Now, he had to tell them about the unknown God. So... So, like I say, we, we need to find out where people are at. Uh, when it came to the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, you know, uh, he was reading from where? Isaiah 53. And, of course, he's reading about the suffering Messiah. And Philip asks him, do you know what you are reading? He says what? 
Yeah, yeah, unless someone show me or tell me or teach me. Yeah, he needed someone to tell him. Um, and uh, how much do they know? How much do they know? People are in various stages as far as their knowledge of the Bible. Like I say, it used to be when you tried to share the, the, the Bible with someone or talk about God, it was kind of assumed that they already believed. But is that the case anymore? As I say, you know, a lot of times, friends, like if you go to the hospital or, or you know, some, some organization, a lot of times they will have religious preference. I mean, usually it means like what? What church do you prefer? And now, and of course they have usually at the bottom of that, the last thing they'll have is what? None. Which is kind of sad. But they say the, sun, the nuns are starting to outnumber the religious, actual religious preferences. So that tells us we've got what? We've got work to do. We've got work to do. We need to go back and look at what we call apologetics. In other words, being able to show someone that God exists. Look at all the evidences and various things like that. So how much do they know? Number four. Number five, where should I start? Like I say, that depends on how much they know and where that they are at. Um, yes, ma'am. Right. I don't know of anything. Um, trying to think of the brother at uh, North Mac that um, what is Gary Rollins? That's who I'm trying to think of. He could he could answer that, and I know there's several others too that 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 you know their their main ministry is the hospitals and so forth. Um, but he could probably answer that. I I doubt that there is anything that would stop us from doing that. You know, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm sure that probably it would be a situation where that you would need to initially ask them, okay, tell them, identify yourself and ask them if, if they would have any problem with, say, praying with them or if they have any needs or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, where should I start? Uh, and then what motivated them to respond? Because there are people who want to know. You know, we've, we've had visitors here. That have come and just wanting to, wanting to you know, ask some questions and so forth. Uh, but what motivated them? A lot of times, a major change in their life. Moving is one of those things. When people move to another community. One of the sad things is that I remember when we worked with a church in Los Angeles. We had tons of people out there that we come across that moved there from, guess where? The Bible Belt. That never darkened the doors again. Why? Well, they said, well, yeah, my, my grandmother was very, you know, she, she was very strong in the church. My parents went all the time. And while I was, while I was at home, I went to church every Sunday and Wednesday night. And, but, you know, since we've gotten here, we just haven't found the time. Yeah. So what were they converted to? What were they converted to? Well, pardon? Gospel itself. All right, tradition. Probably tradition, family tradition especially, is the biggest factor. You know, we have a lot of influence on our children. Hopefully it's not just traditional, but actually developing a relationship with God. So what motivated them to respond? Like I say, there are a lot of people who respond for various reasons. So at any rate, again, we, uh, we went to start out, of course, on the day of Pentecost. 
we ask what motivated those people to respond? Okay, yeah, they found out they had messed up. They, they basically were, were responding out of fear. We had just crucified the Son of God. And their response was, men and brethren, what shall we do? And of course, Peter gives the invitation, and they sang 24 verses of just as I am. And 3,000 people responded. I don't know if you've ever been to some of the old gospel meetings. I, I remember my first couple of years at Harding University, Jimmy Allen. How many of you know about, heard of Jimmy Allen? Okay, mostly the older folks. But he would sing, we would sing verse after verse after verse of just as I am until he got at least 25 or 30 responses. And he would stop you right in the middle of one of them and say, now, I know there are some of you out there that need to respond. And we'll keep singing till you come down. <laughs> it worked, I guess. I don't know. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. Taking one for the team. So, so yeah, uh, you know, so at any rate, that's the way it was on the day of Pentecost. Now, where were they? Or should I say, what did Peter do? We... We or, or preached. You know, the thing is, we, we um, convinced them that they had crucified the Son of God. But what did he use? Where did he go? Is that Romanian? <laughs> yeah. Where where did he? Where? In other words, he preached the first sermon. Pardon? He told them how to be forgiven, but, but there's something even before that. What, did, what part of the Bible did he go to? The part they knew, what we call the Old Testament. The Old Testament. How many of you love studying the Old Testament? How many of you love studying Leviticus? Uh, <laughs> all right. Some hands, went, I don't see any. You know what, I'm crazy, I'm silly, but I love studying Leviticus, Deuteronomy. There are a lot of things that I see in there that I wish we still had today. There are a lot of things. The thing was, the thing is, do we need to study the Old Testament today? I've heard good brethren say, we are a New Testament church. Why do we study the Old Testament? Yeah, we need to know where we came from. Okay. You know, and that's a good part of the New Testament. Comes from the Old Testament explaining how we got to the New Testament, and why Jesus is the Son of God. Exactly. Well, you know, what he said on, on, uh, when he was preaching, giving his sermon on the, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, he said, I came not to destroy the law, but what? To fulfill it. And, and like I say, there are some brethren that ask, why do we study the Old Testament when we're a New Testament church? And some of them, you know, have really are adamant, you know, we shouldn't even have the Old Testament. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, the Old Testament is, is a verification. The book of Hebrews tells us that, it, that the Old Covenant is a shadow of things to come. In fact, the ceremonies and everything that they went through in the Old Testament, the priests and so forth, was what? The forerunner of what Jesus actually did, but not on earth, but he actually entered into what? It says, heaven itself. And he, of course, did what with his blood? Ratify or eradicated sin through the washing of his blood, that is. 
for how long? For all eternity. So we know from that that there was no longer any need for what? Sacrifices for sin. Uh, I want to take, take just a little bit. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Like I say, during the first, first century, there were many people, what was called the, what we call the Judaizers, in which that they, they were teaching the Christians what? That they needed to follow the law along with the teachings of the apostles. And so much of the New Testament is devoted to what? Showing how that we're no longer under the law. Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 15. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. And a, and a covenant is, a, is, of course, what? An agreement. It is legally binding. And, of course, the blood of bulls and goats ratified the old covenant. The blood of Jesus ratified the new covenant. This is now verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. So the seed that God promised Abraham actually was pointing to whom? To Christ, to Jesus. What I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise, for if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made." In other words, the law was given for how long? That verse tells us specifically how long the, that it was given for, how long it was in, in force, and that was till, till when? Did I hear somebody? It was given until the seed, the promise of, to Abraham came, and he points out, as we saw earlier, that seed was Christ. So verse 19 tells how long the law, the old covenant, was to be in force until Christ came. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. So what is he saying in that verse? What did the law do? First, it was given because of what? Okay. All right. Yeah, it was given because of sin, because of transgression, as it's, as it's put there. In other words, it specifically defined what sin is. And when you go through and look, like I say, at, at uh, Leviticus and, and, and so forth, it tells you what the violations are. Um, it says, verse 22 says, but the scripture has been, has, um, oh yeah, let me back up to verse 21. It says, if, if the law had been given which was able to impart life, what did the law do? It did nothing but what? Tell you what was wrong, basically. It tells you, told you that you are under sin. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it says the annual sacrifices did not take away sin. Instead, what did they do? It moved it forward another year, but also it was a reminder year after year that you are still under sin. And that was until Christ came. Verse 22 says, But the scripture was shut up, has shut up all men under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In other words, Jesus became our relief from sin. 
But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So he tells us why the law was given. He tells us how long it was to last. And he tells us what else. The law was given as a tutor to lead us to Christ. Again, going back to the Ethiopian eunuch, when Philip began teaching him about Christ, what did it say? Begin that scripture and he taught him Jesus. That's what he did, starting from there. One of the problems we have is we don't have time factors. How long do you think Philip had to, tell, to teach or preach Jesus to him? We don't know it doesn't say. It's a long way to Ethiopia. Do you think they got all the way to Ethiopia? I don't know. It doesn't say. But apparently, I would say he had a good long time. And I don't want to go any further because I, hopefully we'll get to that. Maybe not this week or today, but maybe next week. The reason I wanted to look at this is because not only do we have brethren that say we shouldn't you know, be studying the Old Testament because we are a New Testament church, but there are also, what do the denominations say about us? Have you ever had someone say, oh yeah, Church of, oh, church of Christ, you don't believe in the whole Bible, do you? Because you only, you only you know, study from the New Testament. Have you ever heard that? I have, many times. Yeah. And partly because, you know, there are some who say we are only a New Testament church, which is true, but there's a lot more to that. Yeah, I've had people say, oh yeah, Church of Christ, you don't believe in the whole Bible. Once when I was working the Bible call program, uh, there was a person that called, and I may have already told you this, but anyway, he says, okay, I want to see in the Old Testament where it talks about there being a New Testament coming. Where does it say that there will be a New Testament or New Covenant? Remember, the word testament and covenant are the same. It's also a will. But where does it say that in the Old Testament? Several places, but the one I took him to was Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 31 through 34. Let's go there real quick. Jeremiah, chapter 31. And, and these verses are repeated, I want to say, three times in the book of Hebrews talking about the new covenant and so forth. Uh, let's begin actually back up um, verse 27, Jeremiah 31. It says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow uh, the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of a man and with the seed of, of a beast. And it will come about that as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to overthrow, to destroy, and to bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. Those days they will not say again, the fathers have eaten our sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone will die with his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Now, verse 31, he says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying... 
know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. That's the best scripture I know from the Old Testament that talks about the new. Number one, it tells us, of course, when did the old, old covenant start? He says, when I, what? Took the children of Israel by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. And then he says they did what with that covenant? They no more got out of Egypt, and what did they do? They broke it. They worshiped idols. In fact, they brought their idols with them from out of Egypt. And they worshiped those idols. But anyway, he says the new covenant would be different. It won't be written on tablets of stone. It would be written on what? Men's hearts and minds. And this, this is the difficult part. They shall not teach again, verse 34, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, know the Lord. What? Does that mean we don't have to spread the gospel? Okay. The thing that was to be done in the first century was to take the gospel where? To the then known world. In Colossians chapter 1, it says that was done several places. The apostles took, and also those others, and we'll look at that in just a minute took the gospel basically to the whole world in approximately 30, 35 years. Yeah. When you, when you go back and study the traditions... Um, of where the apostles went. Who was it that supposedly went clear to India? Was it Thomas? I can't remember. Did somebody just... But, but according to tradition, when you look at studying where the apostles went, they went all over the unknown world. And not only that, okay, last week we, we looked at Acts chapter 8. We'll, we'll, let's move right into that. Acts chapter 8. Now we're covering this because how, how, how much do we need to spread the gospel every, every generation? Basically, we used to ask the question, how many generations does it take before people don't even know God anymore? Not even one. The sad thing is, and I, you know, how many children of parents that are religious or, or were religious don't know God. What about Eli and his sons? Chapter 8, beginning of verse 1. You remember the church was, man, they were having a great time. Everybody was in Jerusalem. What were they enjoying? Apostles teaching, breaking of bread and, and fellowship and all, you know, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? But then the time came when what? Persecution. Why did the persecution break out? You think it's part of God's plan? Definitely. Yeah. In other words, they, they may have stayed in Jerusalem for who knows how long. But in a sense, God's saying, okay, it is time to do what? Fulfill the Great Commission. Take the gospel where? Jesus told his disciples... He would start first in Jerusalem, then go to Judea, then where? Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. I believe it was done the first century. Yeah, without this persecution, let's, let's look at verse 1. And Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Who, who was this? It's talking about Stephen. And on that day, great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except who? The apostles. So who's the they? Yeah, the, what we'd say, average Christians. Then verse 3 says, But Paul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Verse 4, I've got this starred. 
Therefore, those who had been scattered went about what? Hmm, where were the apostles? They were still back in Jerusalem. So who is this? This is, again, the average Christian. And good old Philip, where did he go? Was that a good place to go? Was it, would they be considered good prospects? <laughs> they were Samaritans. Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans, according to John chapter 4, with Jesus you know, talking to the woman at the well. In fact, it is said that, that whenever the Jews were traveling, say, from Galilee to Jerusalem, what would they do concerning Samaria? They would cross over the Jordan, go past Samaria, and then cross back over the Jordan to get to Jerusalem. That's why it was kind of unusual for Jesus to stop off in Sychar or the Samaritan city. So at any rate, and then let's take a look over at chapter 11. Verse 19. Chapter 11, verse 19. This is, you know, a ways down the road from Pentecost. It says, so, th so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose in, per in conjunction or connection uh, with Stephen made their way to where? Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking to no one except to the Jews alone. Okay. We... we you know, we'll, we'll deal with that. But, but again, who, who is this? Who's, who's spreading the gospel? The ones who were scattered. The ones who, many of them probably went back home. And on the day of Pentecost, when the church began, where were those people from? All over the known world. So it wasn't just the apostles spreading the gospel, but... Regular Christians, shall we say. I hate to say regular, but, but you know, we, we have a tendency to separate ourselves, don't we? Do we have paid professionals in the church that we rely on to do what? Do the work of the church. When the church was growing the most back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, who was doing most of the teaching and preaching? Regular members. I can remember even, you know, the times when, when a congregation would say, hey, you know what? They don't have a church over there, wherever it is. Let's get a bunch of people break off, and we'll go over there, and we'll start a church. What's happening today? Go to other churches or go to the I hate to say this, the big churches. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. I hate to ask it, but where's Bethany? I mean, I know where it's at, but I mean, as far as the congregation's concerned. Yeah. But how many people's there? Not very many. I, I could show you a ton of congregations that probably will not be in existence in the next five, maybe ten years. What's happened? How many of you have ever used the Jewel Miller film strips to share the gospel with people? I did. They work pretty good. How many you have ever used the Jewel Miller or remember the Jewel Miller film strips? I use them quite a bit myself. We have the Great Commission still, don't we? The question is, are we taking it to the world? I remember the late 70s, early 80s, that that's when things begin to say, oh, okay, we're going to start combining congregations, and we're going to go out away from the bad places downtown, build, car, build a church out there, we'll combine ourselves and meet out there. 
In other words, combining congregations. The sad thing was that many of those congregations, even after they did that, they wound up regressing back to what? The same size they were before, and now they've got this big new building and a big new mortgage. Yeah, making it a greater travel distance, it, you know, there were all kinds of things. And I hate to say it, but there is a congregation in Oklahoma City that is now no longer Church of Christ. You may have heard about it. They've joined the community church. They took a vote and decided, okay, we're going to join the community church. That's all the information I'm going to give you. You could probably have heard about it or will hear about it. But that's just recently. All right. So anyway, the thing that we, and I've kind of gotten off, off track just a little bit. The thing is that, do we still need to know the, the Old Testament today? Yes, it leads us to Christ. It is a tutor to lead us to Christ. How many people, though, that say, okay, oh yeah, Church of Christ, you're, you don't believe the whole Bible. Well, where do we start from there to show that, yeah, we believe in the whole Bible, and to convince them what? We are under now a new covenant. Where do we go? We've got to go to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. The problem is, if we don't know it, if we don't know that the blood of bulls and goats never took away sin, if we don't know that, that, that Jesus was prophesied about early in the Old Covenant, if we can't share that with them to show them why we are New Testament church, and we convince them of anything, or do we even try? Sure. Okay. Yeah, the Old Testament, you know, the stories are, we remember those from our childhood. And they, they, they are things that stick with us. And so, yeah, it's, it's imperative for our kids to learn those things because there are a lot of what? Important moral lessons coming from the Old Testament. And that they, there are some that actually teach that, that Jesus was not supposed to die. It was a mistake. If that was a mistake, we've got major, major problems. That means what? God was not in control. Jesus was not in control. If it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah, we can go you know, a number of different directions, but, but yeah, that's, that is part of, part of the Gnostic teachings was that they didn't believe that he could have been physically here on earth, that Jesus didn't physically touch ground and so forth, and when he died, it wasn't really him, it was someone else, and there's varying degrees of that. There are people who believe that today. Um, there are people, of course, like I say, that believe that Jesus was not supposed to die, but when he comes back, he's going to correct all that. You can't get into all the different teachings concerning all this stuff. But the thing is, there are those who practice much of the old covenant, which is in direct violation of the new Seventh-day Adventists, I'll name it. When do they believe that they, that they, when do they get together? Saturday. And I do hear people even in the church say, well, but, but isn't, isn't Sunday now the new, new Sabbath? Is Sunday the Sabbath? Is Sunday the, the day of rest now? Never was. 
never will be. Uh, there are a lot of people who, again, like say, have varying teachings about the Old Testament and, and apply a lot of things from the Old Testament. Uh, I may have mentioned the, the church we worked with in Los Angeles, right next door was a Seventh-day Adventist church. That's the reason I'm kind of picking on them a little bit. But in a sense, it was kind of nice because our parking lot was big, not big enough to hold all the cars, so guess where we parked? <laughs> Over in the Adventist parking lot. Same thing with them. Their, their parking lot was not big enough to hold all the cars, so they often parked in our parking lot. I've got to admit, though, it was kind of, you know, it was nice but kind of rough also when they got together on Saturday. They, well, they didn't eat meat, but the stuff, whatever it was they were cooking, sure smelled good. <laughs> it really smelled good. So there are a lot of people. Are there any other people besides, shall we say, the denominations that still teach the Old Covenant? remember to stand behind this thing. I was watching myself just see where I left off last time. I was noticing I'm just all over the place and kind of hard to keep track of. Um, is there anybody else that teaches the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, why, and, and why it's important that we know it? What about the Jews? When I was growing up, you know, as a, as a, as a teenager, we had our youth groups and stuff that we'd get together, and we would often meet with a, a group from, from San Diego. And one of the young men there converted his friend who was a Jew from Judaism. And he went to the Old Testament to show Jesus is the one, is the Messiah. While we were in Los Angeles, the, I was told or understood that the fifth largest Jewish population in the world was where? Los Angeles. New York, it's got to be first or second. And what do they believe in? What do they teach? The law. And, of course, they've got the, the Torah, they've got the Mishnah, they've got, uh, you know. I hear, see somebody's hands over here. Are there any Jews in? Is there a synagogue in Oklahoma City? Um, would they make good prospects? There's one of the questions. Do you think they'd be good prospects to share the gospel with? Okay. Yeah, there are various organizations. Uh, I've heard of Jews for Jesus. Uh, anyway, but yeah. There are various, various individuals or various groups that would be good prospects, even though we may not think so. What about the Muslims? They believe in the law, the books of Moses. Those that you just love, like Leviticus, Deuteronomy, that have all those things and pronounce all those names and numbers and so forth, that, you know, that's the part of the, of the Bible that most people do what? Either skip it or just get through as quickly as you possibly can. Like I said, I love that part. I'm crazy, but I do. Because there's a lot of great stuff in there that, like I said, I still wish that we had today. So at any rate, we've only gotten through, um, like I say, the, the day of Pentecost but we find this over and over in, in chapter 7. Where did Stephen go? What did he preach on before he was stoned? He went to the Old Testament. He went to the Old Testament. Uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Where was the eunuch? Once again, he was where? In the Old Testament. So... Many of the things that we study in the Bible, we may not think are so important, but probably a major part of the religious world goes by much of the Old Testament. And there are a lot of people today in the denominational world that go to the Old Testament for their modern-day prophecies. 
How many times have you heard people you know, go to Daniel and Ezekiel and so forth to, to prophesy today about when the Lord's coming back? Over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 is it the Supreme Court that on their freeze across the top of the steps and stuff, whose who's, who's, uh, image is it, I think, at the very top of it? I think it's Moses, if I remember right. Yeah. All right, that's, that's the bell. Um, I'm going to stop there rather than getting into to something else. Anybody have any questions? Let's entertain any questions that anybody might have. Any questions, comments? Disagreements, I always give you at least five seconds for disagreements. None? No questions? Comments? All right, I appreciate your attention. I forgot, let's end with a prayer. I forgot to start with a prayer. Let's do that. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to study. And Father, we pray that what we learn, what we gain from your word, that we can apply in our lives, share with those around us. And Father, help us that we might have the desire, the zeal to spread the gospel to this whole world and tell them the good news about Jesus. Father, we pray that you be with those not able to be here once again for whatever reason. And Father, we thank you for our visitors that come, and, and Father, pray that you will bless them and watch over them. And help us, Father, to help them and encourage in any way that we can. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.